All right, very good. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, appreciate you again joining here this evening. Uh, we have a quorum, so motion to move our meeting. So oh, man. We can we can move into uh, approval of the agenda. Hope you all had a chance to take a look at that. I don't have anything to add there, so motion to approve the agenda. Motion approved. Move, sorry. Elgar, we have a it. second? Second. Very good. Um, approval of the previous month's minutes. Uh, I didn't see any changes or additions there that were required. Do we have a motion to approve? I move they be approved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Into communications from our pros. Ryan? How about you up first? Put you on the spot. All right. Sounds good. All right. Uh, sunset for um, March. Um, revenue wise, we were projected around 32788 um, Actual came in at about $18,423. Uh, excuse me. Um, rounds, uh, actual, or excuse me, projected rounds for March were about. Uh, 1493 um, came in actuals around uh, 1072 and uh, I think one of the one of the real considerations to why it was down that was that uh, you know that little blip kind of pummeled all of us for a while there we were we were starting off really good for the year um, and I mean even when we were when we we're open like the, uh, yesterday today Saturday super busy. Um, so I, I have, I'm really excited for April, for March, or excuse me, May, June, July, these summer months to really kick it into high gear. But uh, yeah, March was a little was a little tough for us. It looks like. Yep, understood. Any questions for Ryan? Keith, Sam? I'll, I'll go ahead if that's okay. Sam, you go with that? Yeah, go right ahead. Yep. Yeah. I would echo Ryan. Right Sam. I think we were only open 11 days. We had actual 11 days open in March. So, I mean, it wasn't the best, uh, wasn't the best month. And I think Ryan may have even had less than that because Sunset had a hard time uncovering because uh, of number two and number one and those north facing slopes. So, uh, at Twin Peaks, we were 71,000 for March. And probably that's a little bit inflated since Ryan wasn't open and we probably sold a few more season passes than we would have because people go to one course to buy them and they go to the course that's open. So um, we're projected at 37, we made 71.88, it's a good month. This has been a good month, but again, we've only been open, I counted today, 14 days, something like that. So it's really, the, the weather has been tough. It's certainly been a challenge, but we've certainly needed the moisture and that hopefully gets us in a good spot as far as uh, having enough water to get through the summer. We played 1600 rounds for the month, um, which was, you know, pretty good, but not great. But for 11 days, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we've been trying, my, my man Ryan there, the other Ryan that is, Ryan Henning, he'll tell you, we've been trying to get the, the greens verified now for about three weeks in a row and <laughs> we still haven't got it done. So, um, and, and, and to him, to him and his team, they're doing such a good job just trying to reschedule and he's communicated with me and we try to get communications out to everybody and, and it's been tough because we're trying to fill the golf course, but yet we're trying to get it verified and we don't want to upset customers. So it's a, it's a balancing act for us, but we're getting through it and, and he's doing a great job. Good. Any questions for Twin Peaks? No. no. All right. Sam, thank you, Keith. Okay, um, yeah, just to kind of echo with um, with Keith and Ryan, um, you know, we're only open up open ten days, but when we're when the weather's good, we're busy. Um, this past weekend, we were cranking. We had two hundred twenty nine rounds on Saturday and two hundred sixty eight on Sunday, which is 
which is amazing for this time of year. We're starting at starting our tea times at 7.30 or 8, kind of depending on frost. But we were booked each day till about five o'clock. So we uh, we had two great days um, for the month. Um, it actually looks good compared to prior year because prior year we closed March 16th due to COVID. Um, so comparing from last year, you know, we're at 102% in revenues. Um, and April so far, I mean, and then if you look back and when we got reopened, we didn't reopen until 20, the 23rd of April last year. So we are actually um, about $100,000 ahead so far in April. So uh, things are good. Golf is, I think golf, you know, is, is really strong right now. Any questions? I just have a question. Do you think that, and this is for all you guys, has extending the passes, the extra, what, 35 days, I think it was going to be, do you feel like that's impacted your revenue at all or not? Yeah. Not for you, Creek. I don't think so. I think that, uh, I mean, majority of people are buying them anyway. And so they just buy them a little bit later. Yeah. Uh, and I think that the, the, the goodwill that, that, that it raised, I think really made people really happy and thankful. And, and some didn't even find out until they were ready to purchase. And I said, well, you got another 30 days. And they couldn't believe it. And that really made them feel good. Oh, good. Okay. Any other questions? By the way, uh, Keith, I did a like a cost analysis for my group on because some of them are playing Ute Creek on the Tuesdays too. So I did a cost analysis for them on the break even and stuff for the different age groups, and, and they appreciate it. So hopefully, I even promoted a few more passes. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you. Appreciate that. When they, when you really sit down and look at the numbers, it really is a great value. It is a great value. Unless you're having to rent a cart and you got to pay the extra penny, then it gets a little frustrating. Uh, well, they're going to do that anyway. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Sam. Appreciate it. Yep. Um, any public? I didn't. I didn't see that we had any public, Jeff. Mm -mm. I don't think so. Uh, Danny, have you heard from anyone? No, we don't have any public. Okay. All righty. Very good. Um, six, old business. Don't have any old business to attend to. Seven, new business. Uh, youth instructional golf programs. Yeah, one of the, one of the uh, things, uh, Justin Drake, who was on our board for one meeting and he had to resign because he was, uh, his business was relocating him, had asked to talk uh, about uh, our instruction programs for youth. So Keith and Sam are ready to share what they have planned for this summer. Perfect. I'll, I'll start, unless Sam, yeah, I'll go ahead. Uh, at Twin Peaks, as far as youth instructional stuff, we do, you know, number one, I would say we do uh, a lot of individual private lessons for the junior golfers. I give, I'd say probably over half the lessons that I give are given to junior golfers. So, and, and I give a fair amount of lessons. So that's a lot of kids that are getting impacted. And that's, in my mind, the best way to impact them because you can really make a difference in a half hour, hour, and they get them going in a series of lessons. And some kids just take them year round. And uh, that's how they really become really good skilled players. Uh, to get them to that place, we have two programs. Uh, on Mondays, we have beginning June 7th for ages five to nine, we have a program called First Step. And they show up at 10 o'clock. It's a drop-in program. We've made a drop-in for the, uh, mostly for the parents because it's if you don't have to sign up, it makes it a lot easier to be organized. And if you're away on vacation, you don't got to call and, and follow up with us. You just show up when you're in town and we work with you when you get there. So they show up at 10 o'clock. We do uh, about 45 minutes of hitting balls. And when we're out there hitting balls in the range, we put all sorts of targets out there and uh, trash cans and swimming pools. And, and if they knock over baskets, we, and, uh, and, you know, we, we, we give them money when they do these things. We don't give them candy or gifts and stuff. We walk around with rolls of quarters and dollar bills and, 
And uh, if, if they do, and it's pretty neat. And, they, and the kids get really excited. I will say every once in a while, the, the individual who really, really wants to get something and doesn't sometimes leaves a little disappointed. But for the most part, they, they really enjoy it. They get really excited. Uh, and then for 45 minutes, we do a similar, similar thing with putting. We'll set up stations and, and we're teaching them how to putt. And we'll, uh, you know, if they get it inside a, you know, a circle of quarters and they get, they get a quarter. And if they make it, they get a dollar. Wow. And it, it works out well for my business because when they all get done, they come in and they raid the snack bar, which is the number one thing that all children remember about junior golf is the hot dogs and the candy and the restaurant. And that, that has drawn so many children to golf. I can't even tell you. If you tell your children, they want to want to go up to the range and hit balls. They're going to ask you, can we get some candy? So it works out pretty good. Um, and then at the end of it, we offer a, uh, a hot dog, chips, and a drink for $3 for the parents to, uh, that way they, the kids can all sit down and eat afterwards. And uh, it's really gone well. We've done it for a long time. So that's on Mondays for the five to nine-year-old. Then on Tuesdays, we do the same thing with the starting at 10 o'clock. And then, but we, the Tuesday group can get so big. You know, we've had as many as 50 to 60 kids show oh up. Oh, gosh. And, um, and it's me and my, my, you know, assistant, Steve, and we get several volunteers that help us keep the ratios in a good, in a good place, but, uh, we'll get, and that isn't always how it is, you know, but you never know cause it's drop in, but we break them into two groups and we line them up on the range. And then the other group goes on the putting green and then we'll, we switch after 45 minutes. So we don't try to put it. We, we, we teach the little kids together, but we teach the bigger, the bigger kids into two separate groups. And then we, you know, we, we halfway through, we take a little water break and then we switch sides and, and they go to the range and the kids on the range go to the putting green. And then when that finishes up, we offer that same hot dog chips and a drink lunch. And the difference between the first and the next step, the next step on Tuesdays, we give them a playing option. So they get the opportunity to go out on the golf course. And so, you know, this year they'll, they'll finish the lesson at 1130. We're going to give them a half an hour to to kind of relax and eat. We've, we, in the past, we honestly would finish at 12 and rush them through and they're on the tee by 12, 15. So this way they get a half an hour and take their time, eat their lunch. And then we teach them how to go to the counter and pay. So this is in, in, in both programs, we make the children pay. We don't want the parents to pay us. We want the children to handle the money. We want the children to go to the counter after the lesson is over and pay the money for their green fees at the counter. We want them to go to the snack bar counter and pay their money for their food just to teach them some responsibility and to help them grow a comfort level at the golf course. And so then we pair them up and, you know, even before they go in, they're already paired up into groups. So when they go upstairs, they report to the guy that's checking them in. We're in group one, group two, group three, and so on. He puts them in foursomes and then we call them out as groups. They all pay their money. They have their lunch and then they head out and they play nine holes and and our, and our deal on the nine holes is uh, they get six shots, they get four putts on every hole. And so I basically, as they're going out, I, I, I holler at all of them, six shots, four putts, do not get in front of each other. Yeah. Because safety is a big thing, which we obviously stress when we're, we're on the range with them too. But uh, I think in the last 10 years, we've only had one incident and, uh, and one, you know, Two brothers were playing together and one got out in front of the other one. And then the kid, of course, hit the ball while his brother was in front of him. And he hit, hit his brother, but <laughs> it didn't hit him in a bad place and it worked out OK. And I think in my entire career, and this just goes all the way back to my days at Sunset when I took over in 97 there. We've only had one serious injury that, that has ever got hurt at junior golf and that and that individual, you'll see him on Fox 31 News. His name is Evan Krugel. Oh. He turned out okay. Yeah. But he got hit in the eye way oh. back. So, um, but again, he got out in front of his friends and a friend hit the ball and it, it got old Evan. And so anyway, he's, uh, he's doing okay. And he's had a really good career for himself. So anyway, huh. we get him out there on the golf course. We make him keep up with the group in front of him, which is we, we never let the slow groups let they don't get to sit down and relax and let people go by we teach them all to keep up with the group in front of them and i will tell you they are the fastest league we have on the golf course 
they play in less than two hours. They're finishing nine holes in less than two hours. And, and we talked to them about picking up on the golf course and picking up your trash and, and repairing extra ball marks and fixing divots and stuff like that, leaving the golf course better than they found it. So it's been a successful program for a long time. And Fingers crossed, according to uh, the, the health guidelines, we are going to be good to go. So we are planning on doing it. The Monday program will start the 7th. The Tuesday program will start the 8th. That's great, Keith. <laughs> so so uh, June 8th? Yeah, June 7th and June 8th. Okay. Fantastic. And that's all we got for Twin Peaks. So That sounds great. Sounds great. Thank you, Keith. Yep, thank you. Sam, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah. How, do, how does anybody follow that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Keith is probably one of the best salesmen I ever met, but I do have to say he is also, without a doubt, one of the best instructors in this state. And that is, and that is a fact. And he is, without a doubt, the junior golf leader in Colorado in, in Longmont. Um, but he does, he does the great job. Um, we, we do golf, we do junior golf um, here as well. Um, I've done some of the clinics myself over the years. I really don't do that much anymore. I help out when I need to. But Trey Sheehy um, is our, he's a PJ professional. He's been at Ute Creek since the course opened in uh, 1997. Um, he was actually at one time voted the junior golf leader for the PJ section in Colorado. So. He's great as well. Very, very good instructor, but he does our junior camps. They, they pale in comparison to Twin Peaks. Um, but it, for this year, they're on hold. We're not doing anything at this time for, um, for 2021 until uh, Mike Keats mentioned the um, COVID restrictions. And I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here for Trey, but he's, he's, um, He's one of those guys that's um, very paranoid with the COVID stuff. And so he's very, he does classes and stuff, but he's kind of nervous about being around a bunch of kids. So, so anyway, they're on hold at this point, but um, hopefully that changes. That's it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Sam. Yep. Appreciate that. All righty. There's no other questions there. We'll move into B of new business, Ute uh, Creek course presentation. I'm interested to hear about this. <clears throat> Sam, Sam, Sam are you starting? Um, who's starting, Dan or me? Danny, do you know? Sam or Dan, either one of you. I'll go. Who's running the, the PowerPoint? Is that Nikki? Nikki is. Okay. I am. Um, who is starting? Whose presentation do I need first? We'll go with the maintenance one. Dan's. Okay. They're labeled Dan, Dan oh. and Sam. So <laughs> Dan's right. is going first. Dan is going first. All right. Yes. One second. I'll bring that up for you. Thank you for that. While she gets that pulled up, I'll just give a, a quick overview. I'm just going to talk about the, the projects we've been kind of doing the last um, couple of years out at Ute Creek. We started them, most of them back in the, the fall, late fall. We, uh, we got going with these first ones I'll show. But so, yeah, we'll do Ute Creek projects and um, there'll be four of them. So next slide, please. So that, oh, okay, so we're gonna start with the uh, cart mm. path. <laughs> this is the most recent one that we just finished up, uh, actually probably a couple of weeks ago. We just opened up the path today because the sod is pretty well established now. Um, we're still not gonna have any carts drive on it because it's still soft and we're gonna keep that uh, as nice as we can right now because that was a, a lot of square footage of sod. As you can see, we laid over, the company laid over 5,000 square feet of sod on the 10 side and the 11 side. So we were able to uh, fix up a lot of those wear areas out there. Um, and then when you see the path, you'll see they laid 95 tons of <clears throat> path mix, which is at 40, 
nine dollars a ton. So this project, all said and done, cost us about sixteen thousand six hundred dollars. And once we start, you can go to the next slide, please. Once we started doing the project, we realized that the eleven side had gotten really wore out last year with all the golf that we had and all the single rider carts really wore out the, the other side. We'd only really planned to do the 10 side, but when we got into it, it just made sense to, to do the other side also. So, so these are the before pictures. You can see how <laughs> rough that path was and uh, all that. So then this is when they started prepping it. So they actually took the sod cutter and cut all this out individually and uh, tilled it up, used the, the skid steer to remove some dirt. Um, and they did an awesome job of prepping it. You'll see if you ever, if you make it out there, how smooth and how perfect they laid it. So uh, next slide, please. This is just more, this is their, their finished project. These ones here on the left, you'll just, you can just tell how, how awesome that is. Just that gets my blood boiling that, <laughs> seeing that stuff like that. But, uh, but, uh, and then on the ends there, you can see they dug down about um, three, four inches to, so there's a nice base where the path meets the concrete. And so next slide, please. And then there's the finished product. You know, this is, this is the beginning of 10 over here on the left and then down the middle. And then up there, you can see where it kind of turns and goes to 11 too. But, but like I said, it, it looks great. So that was, that was job well done by, by L&M. Uh, or actually that one was done by GNS Solutions. So, all right, next please. Yeah, Dan, I was out there this past weekend. It looks great. Yeah, they did. They did a good job. So, um, so this is the next one, uh, eight and 18 lake banks. These ones, um, over the past 20 years, the waves have just started to wash out underneath the banks and had made the banks very unstable and pretty unsafe for mowers, carts, people basically just walking on them. There's, you know, they could have collapsed at any time. So it, this is a project we've been trying to do for a while and we had it scheduled for the beginning kind of of 20, but when all everything hit, it just got pushed back. So, so we started out um, with number eight first. So next slide. Oh yeah. So eight, eight Lake Bank was, um, was about 500 linear feet of shoreline that we fixed up there. And that took 254 tons of riprap. Um, and you'll see once they did it, uh, the whole process they did. But, and then we also added a little extension. Um, we did it for our mowers for when they turn around when they're mowing greens, but the golfers are gonna be really happy with it too, with the little uh, extra, <laughs> extra yeah. landing Yay. area. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, so you got about an extra 30 feet, you know, it was about 3,000 square feet total, you know, that we laid there of sods. So, so yeah, you got some, some extra room to play off of, you know, and we opened it. We're, we're ready to let people hit out of there. It's pretty solid right now. So, and that project came to about $40,000. So, so I'll show you some pictures here of all the work they did. So next slide, please. Yeah, you can see before, and most of you have been out there, you know how, how just unfinished it looked, you know, so. Once we uh, got going, it just really made it worth it. <clears throat> so next slide. Yeah, they came in with all this road base and fill material and just, they were actually able to, we were able to lower the lake for them. So they were actually able to get inside the lake. The next one you'll see, they had to do it all from the top, but, but they filled that all the way across and then they laid the rock on top of the road base. So, so next slide. And then this is the extension, you'll see it. it wow. It, yeah, it, it, it added a lot of area and it, and it finished it, you know, where the lake's kind of circular now instead of cut out in there. I mean, that was a good look like that, but, but it was a safety issue. And probably, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, we did have one guy slide in off that bank when it was frosty and kind of dewy out there. So, so it, was, uh, it was well worth it. So next slide, please. Yeah, and then you'll see, <clears throat> this is where they, they laid the rock. Um, they kind of would just come in with a skid steer and dump, and then the, the track hoe would kind of <clears throat> level it out. And uh, yeah, they made their way around. So next slide. And then, whoops. And then we, U Creek staff, came in and added an irrigation to that whole lake bank, because it would, 
in the summer months, you know, that's a, that's a south facing slope. So it would get really hot. And um, we wanted to add irrigation to that new area. You know, we, we spent the money to build it up. So we wanted to irrigate it and keep it looking nice. So we did the whole lake bank. So it'll, that'll all be irrigated now. And it should have a lot more dense turf on there in the summertime. So next slide, please. Yeah, and there we are laying the sod. So <laughs> they we, they deliver, delivered the sod up on the road, and then we took our tractor and and brought it down. There was probably uh, six of us or something laying it. Two guys would would lay it out, and the other four guys or so would come and drop it. And and uh, then there on the end, you just want to really soak it down <clears throat> when you uh, when you get sod down there to get it to establish. So, next slide. And then this next one is uh, 18 Lake Bank. This one was 600 linear feet and 304 tons. And this one came, came to 34,000. The reason this one was less is because we didn't add that bank and add the sod and add the irrigation. So this one, this one looks really good too. They helps finish the hole. And, and this one was the one that was really getting undercut the worst that we were most worried about our big rough mower and parts and all that. So, so next slide, please. So this one you can see, how all that stuff was already falling off. And in the next pictures, they'll show how, how uh, the company um, actually just pushed it in the ground, into the lake and used that as some of their material to lay the rocks on. These guys actually, they did most of the work by hand with shovels and stuff. So they used the excavator a little bit, but, but they, had a, they had a little different approach and, and it turned out good, you know? So this is them laying the rock here with the excavator. So next slide. Wow. And uh, yeah, they just kept going. You can see it in the middle. You can see the, the one on the left too, how their banks, they use, they use dirt and stuff too, but uh, they didn't use quite as much road base. But, and then when you do projects like this in, in late December, you end up with um, frozen lakes. <laughs> so, so therefore the excavator comes in good to break that up <laughs> and they can get their rocks down in there further. So, next slide. Yeah, I mean, there it is, the, the finished product. So. So it, it, it looks good. Both, both projects looks really good. Um, it looks great from the clubhouse. It looks great from Pace, or 17th Avenue, sorry, when you're driving, you know, it, it makes it stand out. So, so it was job well done. So next project, please. And this one was just, uh, this is for us maintenance guys here. Our, uh, our old shop here, um, we had done this project probably 10 years ago, and it has just been wore out and it was so dusty, you know, in our dry summers, anytime a cart or, or any type of equipment would drive through, there would just be a dust cloud. And, and our mechanic works just over here to the left in this left, right picture. His shop's right over there to the left, and he's like the main road right through there. So he would just get bombarded with dust all day. So, so we got a hold of, um, well, our safety officer got a hold of our operations team, and they came in and and did this project for us. So it's very well appreciated. So next slide, please. You can see this is them prepping it. <clears throat> they kind of went through and, and leveled it out because it had humps and bumps and, and all sorts of stuff. So they went through and then the middle ones, the big trucks that brought it in and then they would just dump piles there and, and the uh, big big grader would come through and, and level it out and, and they did a great job. So next slide. This is the big machine. They didn't uh, skimp on size of the equipment they brought in to help us out. So, so that was nice. This thing's got a what they call laser levels on there. So he can go along and I'm not positive how it works, but it kind of goes on its own and just makes everything perfectly flat, you know. And then they, the other guys here on the picture on the right would do a little handwork. You got to touch up all the edges. And, and this guy in the skid steer would come and do all the small areas that the big guys couldn't get into. So. Um, next slide. Yeah, and then they came through and they rolled it all. They rolled everything, the wow. whole place, back and forth to really compact it down. So, so it should should be good for quite a while. Hopefully, by the time that that new facility comes. <laughs> um, but and then they sprayed it with magnesium chloride, and and that should really keep the dust down. And and luckily it rained, which really helps too. So it started to rain a little bit, and then all the snow and other rain we've had. Has really compacted it down. So, like I said here, we appreciate all the help from other city organizations, and it's going to be great this summer not having that that dust blowing everywhere. So, 
So that's uh, that's U Creek in the last few months with our major projects. A lot of work. Any well done. <laughs> Thank you. Any yep. other questions? Well, well done, Dan. Appreciate it. Well, if not, um, Sam. Well, while we're waiting for the slide, um, I just want to mention about Dan and his crew. They do a great job on this golf course. I think you all, you saw the course this last weekend, Earl. Uh, Marsha, I know you've been coming out and playing as well. And it's so nice seeing that we're actually putting money back into the golf course. Um, mm -hmm. This is kind of a new thing for us since Jeff Friesner came on. It's been fantastic. Um, that rip wrap that Dan Dan mentioned on hole number um, number eight. When you come in, when you come in, your first impression of the golf course is now with the rip wrap. So you got a great first impression, then you also got a great last impression. When you leave the golf course, coming down eighteen, you see the same thing. So it's it, it's really made some great improvements. So it's it's really nice to see. Yep, yeah, agreed. It looks great. Okay, so you Creek Operations. Um, well, we were lucky enough to um, be voted Golfer's Choice Award um, in 2021. Um, what they do um, every year is they rate the top 25 courses in each state. And um, we were lucky enough to get on to be a part of that. This is all review based. So, because I was kind of curious when this first came out, I'm like, how did we get this award? How does this work? You know, so I contacted the company and, I'm, and um, asked some questions. And they said, it's all based on reviews. And um, they, they sometimes will send reviews out. Like you, like if you go, if you go somewhere and you book it online, you'll get prompted to do a review. It's kind of works that way. Mm -hmm. And the next page will show you a little more about that. So next page, please. Uh, that's the wrong one. Oh, sorry. Okay, so so a summary of the, of the reviews, you can see that of the people that did the reviews, there was 365. And our overall rating was a 4.4, which is very good. About 96% of people that play U Creek would recommend it to other folks. And, um, and the reviews were based on six different areas. One is conditions. Obviously, the maintenance guys um, are nailing it on the conditions then. Um, the value of the golf course. Uh, course layout, Robert Trin Jones, the second design, no surprise there that that's a high rating. Um, friendliness of staff, um, probably days that I wasn't working. No, just, but um, no, we do. We got a great staff here, I think, from, uh, from our pro shop, our snack bar staff, our um, volunteer marshal program. I think the folks do a great job. But our two weakest areas is the pace of play and amenities. Um, you know, the, the uh, Robert Trin Jones, the second design is a, is a tough course and um, it presents a challenge and pace of play has been an issue for us. Amenities as well. And so I'm gonna to touch on those two areas on the next few slides here. So the next one, please. Okay, so to give some background on our clubhouse amenities um, and how our current setup came to be, this is the original plan um, for the U Creek Pro Shop and Restaurant. So if you look at the slide here on the, on the far left, um, it says North Elevation Phase 2. That's our current, current Pro Shop, and that's looking at it from like the first tee. Then if you go to the right-hand side, you'll see um, Phase 2 and Phase 1. 
that's a west facing view. So like from the 18th green, that's looking back at our clubhouse and what was supposed to be our restaurant. The, um, the restaurant and the original plan was gonna be a full service restaurant, could seat 144 player tournament um, afterwards to my understanding. So it was a great place um, in the plans to, um, you know, to promote tournaments and, the, and, um, and just for our day-to-day -day use having um, a facility for our golfers, but the funds ran low. So the decision was to made to uh, do the building in phases. So we did phase one to start with, that's our current building. And so everything inside of our building now is temporary. Um, the snack bar area is a temporary setup. The dining room is temporary. So everything is crammed into one small area. That's why we have such a small dining room and why our, our snack bar is so limited because it's supposed to be a temporary situation, but we're still waiting uh, for the funds to get this done. However, we have made a lot of, um, we've done a lot of improvements over the years and it's been kind of a challenge for us. And I think we've done some really fun things. So on the next, next slide, we'll start, we'll get into that a little bit more. So improvements to the amenities, um, we addition of new patio furniture, uh, addition of the lower pavilion and picnic tables and uh, improved uh, food selection. Next slide, please. Okay, so this, this is a, a picture from our, um, our phase two area, which is now a patio. And it's not a bad thing, it's a great patio. Um, the views overlooking the 18th hole in the northern front range, it, it's awesome. And Jeff, um, again, I mentioned Jeff puts money on the golf course. He purchased these tables and chairs for us and they're high quality and they have really dressed it up. So um, it's nice. It's not, it's not a full service restaurant, but it's, it's really a nice place. I mean, when I came in this afternoon, um, there was about... I don't know, 10 tables were filled out there, uh, spread apart, of course, you know, with the COVID stuff, but um, it was it was busy. Uh, next slide, please. So to really, like I mentioned earlier with the, with the restaurant, trying to um, sell tournament, tournaments is huge business for us. And you have to have an area that a tournament can come in afterwards to do their awards and their dinner. Um, course was built in 1997. I don't know what they did before 2003, but the Qantas Club donated this pavilion for us. And then in 2008, we went ahead and added picnic tables. I, I got here in 2006, and for the first couple of years, I was really pushing hard to get golf tournaments. And every time I'd fill it up, I had to rent tables and chairs to make it happen. So we finally got these picnic tables put in, and now it's... Um, it's a really nice place for uh, folks to do their award, or tournaments to do their awards. Next slide, please. Um, the um, next slide, please. Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Go back. <laughs> oh, sorry. That's all right. My fault. I got a little ahead of myself there. Um, one, one right there. Another thing that we'd like to see happen here, um, and we've been actually kind of working on it for the last couple of years. This, in 2020, we're really gonna start trying to push for to get more uh, weddings and stuff out here. It, it'd be a great wedding venue with the, with the setting that we have overlooking the golf course. Um, it would be perfect. And the pavilion is a great place for it, but it just needs to be dressed up a little more. And I don't know what that would really entail. You know, I kind of, I kind of picture like some wood beams and stuff. I don't know, just to, just to pretty it up some. But the other big issue with doing weddings for us is it's not enclosed. Um, so when the weather comes in, it could be a disaster. And 
I've seen it happen. I remember one time, it might even be this one here, the picture here, but one time we had it all set up. We had all the wine glasses, everything set up on the tables and a gust of wind came through and we lost every glass. Um, so if, if some, that would be my wish list. If somewhere down the road that we can get this thing enclosed, I kind of picture like a garage door type of uh, like a fold down door, something that we can open air. And if it starts to get bad, we can bring it down. But um, what are the improvements? So um, yeah, much better. Anyways, next slide. <laughs> So the Ute Creek snack bar was intended to be a temporary setup. I thought I had a picture on this one um, until the uh, phase two could be completed. Um, so right now we have no fire suppression system and no hood. So we're very limited on our uh, kitchen equipment. We had, we, we, we were set up with a hot dog roller. Um, <laughs> a hot dog roller, a microwave oven, and um, and that was about it. Next slide, please. I forgot there was one more, I can't think. Um, there it is, we had an extra slide in there for some reason. Um, so without the hood and fire suppression system, our meals were limited to basically cold sandwiches. Actually, that's on the next slide. Go back up, I'm sorry. <laughs> One of the slides got, we got an extra slide here, it's confusing me, which is not hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, okay, Sam, we have a sandwich table. We got a sandwich table and a hot dog roller. So basically all we've been able to really do is cold sandwiches, sandwiches, wraps, hot dogs and brats. Um, We've tried a bunch of different things over the years to try to amp up our food service for just the day-to-day -day, um, customers. And um, one of the things we did is we, we tried a gas grill. We put that out in the back of the snack bar so that we can cook hot food. Mm. Um, and that was really, it was difficult, kind of difficult because there was no flow to it. Um, so we still use that for tournaments. It works great. You know, when we have tournament outings, we, that's what we use to uh, prepare food. We use the, the gas grill. Um, we can go to the next slide now. So we came across this back in 2013. This is called an auto fry. And what this is, it's a fryer that has a self-contained fire suppression system. And that, that has really helped us a lot. I mean, we're nowhere cl close to where we need to be yet, but it is, it's been a huge help. We've got a lot of fun food items now. Um, go to the next slide, please. Yeah, this is basically what we were able to do prior to the auto fry, cold sandwiches, dogs, brought. I gotta say though, our brats are delicious. They're um, all beef, quarter pound, our brats. We, do, we put a lot of work and effort into finding the best brat, but that was all we had. You get a sandwich, dog or a brat and chips. And uh, that was pretty much our only selection. Next slide. Now that we got the auto fry, um, you can come in and have a ice cold beer and a cheeseburger after you're around. And with fries instead of potato chips. Chicken sandwiches. Next slide. Wings, our wings are amazing as well. I got the waistline to prove it. Chicken tenders. And that's just a kind of an example of what we can do now. So we, it, it, there has been some improvement made uh, with our food selection. Again, it's not, it's not anywhere, anywhere where it needs to be, but um, it is definitely better than what it was with just that one piece of equipment. Okay, um, before I go into a pace of play, is there any other questions? Any questions at all? Okay. Um, so about Ute Creek, again, I've kind of mentioned already, um, Robert Trin Jones, the second design, um, world-class golf course. We're very lucky to have this course here in, in our Longmont community. Tough course, so it's definitely has been our challenge for pace of play. 
And the next slide, please. So here's some of our challenges for the pace. Um, we got five lakes, they now have riprap on them. We got five lakes that come into play on six of our holes. Um, the two creeks that, that meander through the golf course, um, that comes into play on seven of our holes. We got native grass on, on every hole, which, and Ute Creek being a link style golf course is really important to have the native grass. We, we gotta be careful about how we maintain it, but, um, cause the native grass really defines our course because we don't have all the trees. So that's really our, is a really nice feature. However, the native grasses, um, you know, you hit, a, you hit an errant shot into the native grass, it takes forever to find the ball and then it's difficult to get out of it. Out of balance on almost every hole, 55 uh, sand bunkers. We got multi-level fairways uh, for difficult approaches to the greens. Um, undulating greens for difficult putting conditions. Our greens can be tough if we want to make them tough. And forced carries on several holes. There's many holes out here that you have to either carry a greenside bunker, a fairway bunker, um, creek, the lake on a couple of holes, some native area. Um, yeah, it's a tough course. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. So we we we've come up with like five different. Um, five different steps to, to improve our pace of play. Some of these are ongoing and some are kind of new, but we've increased our course marshal and first tee greeter staff, um, trying to educate our players a little more. We've added white tees um, and we try to do an easy course setup during peak times. And again, to maintain the, the native areas in some strategic areas. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a this is a sample of our um, or this is our schedule during our peak season. And the biggest change that we made going into this season is we amped up our our greeter, our first tee greeter, from six o'clock in the morning until two o'clock. So we have somebody out there standing on the first tee for the first eight hours a day, seven days a week. We used to only have that on the weekends. But we, I think that's probably the most important position out here because those guys can, can meet the players when they come to the tee. They can talk about any conditions on the course that are relevant. They can suggest the correct tees to play from um, and also talk about our pace of play. Our pace of play our is, should play in four and a half hours. That doesn't always happen. I, I don't know what your pace of play was like this past weekend, Oral, but we started off great. Started off at four and a half, but by the end of the day, we were we were close to five hours. Um, we were four and a, we were right at four and a half. Yay! Glad to hear that. What was your yeah, tee time again? It was great. Uh, we teed off at tenish. It was after the men's club, so That's yeah, great. it was great. Once the tee time start getting to about the one or two o'clock time, those folks start finishing in about five hours because it's. You know, pace of play is like a one lane road. You can only go as fast as the, as a group in front of you. And um, that's why we have amped up our marshalling so that we have marshals on the course from the first tee time of the day to the last tee time of the day, just to help with uh, and assist players. How, how many minutes are between groups teeing off? And that's a good question actually, because that varies from golf course to golf course. Um, our standard in Longmont has always been eight minutes. Yeah. Um, but we changed that last year because of COVID. Yeah, and I thought we now, did. We're now at 10 minutes. And that's helped a lot as well because it just it just takes some of the pressure off and obviously just makes for a more enjoyable experience. Um, the only concern with that is, you know, you're losing almost two tea times per hour. So you start doing the math on that. That's a lot of revenue. Yeah, but our demand is so high right now that we're filling the golf courses up more days of the week. Like for instance, we used to really rely on our Friday, Saturday, and Sunday times to generate our revenues. But we're filling up almost every day. So ten yeah. minutes. Ten minutes yeah. works great. As a recently retired person out during the weekday, one can ask yourself if anybody works anymore. 
<laughs> I ask that all the time. I these these thirty something are out here all the time. I think they're working from home, but um, it's unbelievable how many how many young guys play every day of the week. They're out here playing. It's amazing, which is great for us. Right. <laughs> You know, like we mentioned earlier in the, in the conversation, we, we talked, you know, golf is strong and that's been one of the, one of the great things from COVID. I just hope that that continues for us now when things start getting back to normal, but right now it's great. So 10 minute intervals, you know, I think we all agree. We're going to try to stay with that for now. Okay. Next slide, please. So player education, you know, we, Speaking of all these new guys coming to the game, a lot of folks just don't know how to play fast golf. So we have these cards. It's like um, like three like three inch by maybe eight inch, and it's two sided. The pace of play policy is on one side. The ready golf rules are on the other side. And this is one. It's a good tool for our for our marshaling staff. Like for instance, the first tee greeter, you can go to that first bullet point and say USGA recommends four and a half hours for you Creek. Then you go down to the bottom of that card and say, here are the suggested tees based on your handicap or your ability, you know, make it fun for yourself. Don't go all the way back, go up, make, you know. So it's just a matter of getting the guys to play from the right tees it helps a lot with the pace of play. And um, ready golf rules. A lot of folks just don't really understand how to keep it moving. And these are just some very helpful attempts to uh, help people with that. We've got these available in the pro shop and our, our marshals have them available to hand out as well. Next slide, please. Yeah, I love the white tees. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> you, you bet, man. And you know, it's, you, I think that we all been around golf long enough that we grew up whenever it was three sets of tees, red, white, and blue. And then the red was for women white was for men and blue was championship. So you would never catch a guy on the red tees. Those are ladies right. tees. But that stigma is really starting to go away. It's amazing how many guys you see playing from the red tees now. Um, There's quite a few more that should be. There, there should, should be a player from like the 150 markers, but, um, <laughs> but having the uh, suggested tees by course handicap, um, I think really helps because the guy can just look at, Hey, yeah, they're telling me to play from these tees because of my handicap says so we not, we have it on the face of play card and we have it on the scorecard as well. That's uh, good. Okay. Next slide, please. And then easy court setup during peak times. Well, peak times is every day now, but um, Friday, Saturday and Sundays are, and really, Except for ladies' days, we try to keep the course easy. On ladies' day, we make it really as difficult as we possibly can. I've noticed that. <laughs> I think you even move in more sand traps. <laughs> we have 55 of them. Oh. Um, but on the scorecard, you see the uh, you see the pin sheet or the or the whole location chart. We got one through six. Uh, this serves two purposes. One, it um, it helps with the wear and tear on the greens. So the maintenance guys just kind of follow that program. And then two, it helps the golfers to know um, where approximately where the, where the pin is at on the greens. I mentioned earlier that the greens are very undulating. So as they're doing the course setup, they try to um, try to find the flattest areas on the green. So just to make the putting as easy as possible. And then also we try to move the tees up as well every chance we get. Next slide, please. To me, I think this has been made the biggest improvement on pace of play because I can't tell you how many times I've just seen guys out there looking for that $5 golf ball and just spending forever looking for it. So the native area we identified a couple of years ago, the areas marked in blue, um, and we started to maintain them, but we just got aggressive with it. Um, the proposed areas were marked in yellow. And um, we are now cutting all of those areas down. And um, I think that's helped tremendously with our pace of life. Hey, can I ask a question? Um, yeah. Have you noticed anything as a result, most of the people are leaving the pins in? Has that made any difference at all? 
as on pace of play, I, I don't really, I mean, that's a good question, but I don't know. I, I don't think so, but okay. I mean, it, it's possible. I was just curious. Yeah, because it's that one less step of putting the flag back in. So, and the rules of golf now, you can leave it in as well. So that's kind of right. changed just prior, prior to COVID as well. Um, that's it for Ute Creek. Any other questions? That was good. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Sam. Appreciate that. Yeah, thanks, Earl. Uh, any items from the staff at all? Board nope. members, staff? Nope. No? Can I ask a question? <laughs> Am I yeah, staff or please. not? <laughs> yeah, right, yep, the board. Board. yep. Um, two things. First of all, just so you know, I, I, my wife and I here moved here about 12 years ago. And I live about uh, seven minutes from Twin Peaks and seven minutes from Sunset. So I go back and forth. Uh, it have been for, you know, 11 or 12 years. Last week, I was at U Creek and with a couple and we teed off on four. And the man hit a, you know, hit his tee ball and about 200 yards in the air, hit the tree on the right side and bounded out in the air in the street would you believe hit a car coming by broke the windshield <laughs> oh so I, that means i mean i've been playing there for 12 years the first time it's ever happened but what came up uh was everybody was wondering well gee do they ever thought about putting you know some kind of fence along that the uh was it third third street and just perhaps, perhaps preventing that from happening i'm just curious if what's the background on that you're referring to hole number four at sunset, correct? Right, right. Okay. Um, Jeff, I don't know if you want to answer that, but I've I've had this come up, but I think we went against that at one point because it's going to cost, it would cost outrageous amount of money. I bet it would. Well, and I, I think it also is a impact to the neighbors. We would, if we were going to consider that, we'd need to do some real uh, public uh, meetings to get their input because looking out that all the time at, at that big tall fence, I think is gonna give them an opinion that it's, uh, it may save cars and windows, but it it's, could be pretty ugly looking. Yeah, well, I would agree with that, Jeff. I would think the neighbors in the neighborhood would really oppose that. Yeah. Well, I was just and, curious. I mean, yeah. it, it was just amazing to think about that yeah. it bounced off the tree. Yeah. He, didn't, he didn't even hit it out there or slice it out there you know it had to hit a tree and then right at that moment a car had to be driving by and it had i mean it was amazing and of course the car stopped and he went over there and they you know exchanged insurance stuff and a lot of good stuff the good. other the other question i have today <laughs> I, I played with a couple of elderly ladies and they were sort of upset that they couldn't drive their uh, cart out to their car to put the clubs in and I'm curious as to what controls that, or can we open that up or not? Good to try out uh, for sunset. For any of the courses. Well, well Twin Twin Peaks, you can. Oh, okay. Yep. And that's what, have... you know, I go back and forth those two. And I, so I thought, well, Twin Peaks can. Why can't uh, you know sunset? Do you want me to go? Yep. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of give a brief explanation to one of the one of the main reason reasons to why we don't do it at sunset is on a busy given day for sure, like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, even today, I played myself uh, as well out there today. Um, we don't have enough carts with single riders, with everyone taking single riding carts and whatnot. If there's four carts in a group and I've got, you know, right now we've got um 12 rental cars that we get from Massic. And then we've got an additional uh, 27, I believe. Is that correct, Ryan? Yeah, 27 electrics at sunset, one of which is still down. We're trying to figure out the error code that it's throwing. Um, so if, if we do that, I mean, 
the problem when you finish a lot of players, when they go to the parking lot, they end up mingling, they sit around, they take their time. Oh. It ends up being a little too slow for the 10 minute, even with a 10 minute interval, mm -hmm. but trying to disinfect the cart, get it cleaned and prep for the next group. That's a small process by itself. Right. It's five to 10 minutes to turn the car and have it disinfected properly. So that alone, if I've got no carts and four carts come off and run to the parking lot and I have a group that's supposed to be teeing off, now that puts me in a dilemma that I could be five to 10 minutes, even 15 minutes behind, then puts us into a small dilemma of, well, you've got too many people gathering together that are not within the same household. Mm -hmm. Then if one person, it only takes one person to uh, contact Boulder County or the city yeah. And that puts the pros ourselves under a little bit of heat because we have our own licenses um, for the food and beverage and mm. liquor licenses. And if any of that got shut down for any reason, right. then the city is going to look at us and say, hey, we've got to we've got to have a different conversation. And well, may, we don't want to have to may I make a suggestion, because I know a lot of the ladies that play in our Twin Peaks League, League also play in the Tuesday League. Is there any chance that you can hire like a high school kid or something for the summer to help carry bags out to the parking lot? One issue with that, in my opinion, I, I'd, I'd love to do something like that, but um, a lot of people don't want others touching their, their equipment. Yeah. And with COVID, you're not supposed to touch someone else's equipment mm -hmm. at this time. Yeah. So, um, and, and who knows, by the time, Mar uh, May rolls around. If if all restrictions get lifted, then that's a different animal. Yep. Uh, you know, yep. We the, we'll all let carts go into the parking lot at that point. If if I can justify that, I have enough cars to survive at least yeah. three extra tea times, so we don't have a delay. And and really, uh, the pace of play issue would be the next phase. So yeah, no, I understand. You know, I'm all about it. At at one point here soon, it's coming. <laughs> Hey, nice. Ryan, I wanted to ask you too, did you guys get, uh, you, I know you had a lot of damage um, on the course after that big snowstorm we had yeah. in, in March. It looks like you got all the branches and stuff cut down. Do you have any stats as to how many, you know, how much you removed? Um, I think uh, from what I remember recalling, and uh, Ryan, you, if you want to step in and if you know the number, but I think we had around eight to nine pretty large branches that came down. Um, yeah. Ryan, am I, am I close? Yeah, I'd say somewhere in that ballpark. We didn't count them um, specifically since the city's forestry department came out and helped us clear a lot of the large ones. Oh, okay. Yeah. Since, they, since um, some were still attached to the trees themselves and they had to climb and use their bucket truck to get it. And then they used their grappler truck to haul it away. So a lot of that removal was out of was past our um, abilities, but as of right now, all of the, we did not lose any one tree. It was this large branches off a tree. Right, so we didn't right. lose any specific trees during it. And right now they are all picked up except for a few back behind the maintenance shop that are still yeah. hanging out back there. Got it. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Any other questions? Jeff, this any, is Al. Uh, final words? Yeah, go ahead, Al. Hey, I just want to, for, the one for Sam and for Tim, you know, I live in that neighborhood of Ute Creek, and that phase two is really intriguing because there is no real bar on our whole side of town or a sit down restaurant. So, you know, if we get that done, it'd be awesome. But um, I wanted to tell you guys, I've been traveling extensively to Florida, South Carolina, and I'm in California. And when I come, I play other municipal courses. Ours are far superior to anything I've played anywhere else. I mean, all these other munis are just a mess. They could take a page out of your guys' book, what you've done with our courses. Yep. So, and then the, the other thing, Sam, is there an actual menu for the snack bar? I have no idea those French fries and cheeseburgers and that. Am I missing it? Or am I, I just looking at, am I focusing on the bar? <laughs> 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 that's what i do when i go to the golf course as well so um <laughs> okay <laughs> Fair enough. you know again we we're not a restaurant we, we are really a temporary snack bar setup with limited um 
with limited equipment to prepare meals. So we do not have a menu, but I don't know if you noticed in the slides, but the picture that we had of the snack bar, there's a chalkboard that you can right behind the counter there that has all of our yeah. stuff on it. I never could get past the drink deal for the menu, so. <laughs> Thanks. Next time you're out, you got to try one of our hamburgers, man. They are delicious. Jeff, any uh, final comments? Nope. Uh, thank you, uh, Sam and Dan. You did a great job on the presentation. I thought there was a lot of good information. Yeah. Um, Ryan Hennings and Keith will be presenting at uh, the next time we meet about uh, okay. Twin Peaks. Very good. And, Excellent. Uh, and Jeff, for yourself and uh, Councilman Waters, uh, do appreciate the uh, volunteer gift certificate that was sent along our way. Um, very much appreciated. Thank you good. for that. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Thank all of you for all the time you put in to help us. Thank you all. If there's nothing else, uh, motion to adjourn. Move we adjourn. Elgar approves or seconds. All right. Thank you all, folks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you. We'll see you Bye. next time. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. Thank you.